Welcome to World Affairs Today, brought to you by the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C., a leading forum for global education and international affairs. Good afternoon. I'm Heidi Shoup, President of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C., and it's my pleasure to welcome you all here today. Administrator Bolton, Excellencies, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you for joining us. On behalf of the Board of Directors, I want to welcome you here to join our board and council members for this timely discussion of the future of space exploration and international cooperation with Charles F. Bolden, Jr. We are honored to have you here with us today, sir. Thank you. With the administrator on the podium will be Brian Kelly, who serves as editor of the U.S. News and World Report. And in the interests of transparency, I have to tell you that Brian is also a member of the World Affairs Council Board of Directors. Brian, please stand up and let people see who you are. Mr. Bolden will be introduced by Mr. Richard Heeb, Vice President of Exploration and Mission Support for Lockheed Martin Information Systems and Global Solutions. Rick is a former astronaut who had a distinguished career at NASA, including flying aboard shuttle missions 30, 49, and 65. In 1992, during the shuttle mission 49, aboard Endeavor, he and two of his colleagues set the record for the longest spacewalk in history, eight hours and 29 minutes. This broke the record set by Apollo 17 astronauts 20 years previously. Until just a few days ago, that record held. All told, he logged over 17 hours of spacewalks. Today, we are honored to have him walking in this space with us. Thank you very much. So, of course, there's always prepared remarks, but I'm sort of every communications person's nightmare. <laughs> I, I did a little research on the web this morning, and I discovered that if you type in Charlie Bolden, uh, Google came up with 1,900,000 hits. So I kind of think if you want to know more about Charlie than there is in our program on the web, you can certainly find it. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about Charlie, my friend, more than uh, Charlie you see on the web, although I, I have to start with one other sort of tidbit about the three-person spacewalk. Uh, it was the longest on record for quite some time, but Tom Akers, who's a, a country by, boy from Missouri, said when we were post-flight, we were talking and somebody talked about this record, he said, well, you know, it's hard to take too much credit for a record like that when you only said it because you couldn't get the job done in the time you were supposed to. <laughs> He kind of burst our bubble with that, <laughs> but it was absolutely true. You know, I've known Charlie for uh, over 30 years, and a lot of you, I think, know, know Charlie as well. That, to me, one of the interesting things about Charlie is his background as a, as a pilot flying combat missions. Now, a lot of times people will say, so, you know, were you scared when you were going to fly in space? I mean, part of me says, yeah, if you're on the launch pad and you're not at least a little bit scared, you're probably not smart enough to be there. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that can go wrong, and, and that's what we do at NASA. That's what the space program is about, is being on the cutting edge and operating right out there on the edge of things. But on the other hand, the big difference between working for NASA and space missions and combat missions is, at NASA, everybody's trying to keep you alive, right? It's a pretty big difference there. Charlie's a, he's a family man. For those of you that know him, you would know that very much about him. And before we go fly in space, one of the things that uh, my first crew commander who went to the Naval Academy with Charlie, Mike Coates, it was his third flight and he sat us rookies down and he said, you know, you got to think about, you know, what would happen if you didn't come back and, you know, who would help take care of your kids and, and so on. And so you start thinking about people that, you know, you might use to, to help with that. And you start thinking about people like Charlie and it doesn't take long before you start going, you know, that's such a good idea. Maybe I'll just give Charlie my kids right now. <laughs> it, 
he'd, he'd have probably ended up with a lot more kids than he wanted that way if we'd have, if we'd have done that. Yeah, you know, when we were when we were thinking about the next administrator, and, and, and a lot of us had a chance to, to have some thoughts about that, and Charlie's name came up, I was certainly one of the people that was really excited about the idea of Charlie coming to do this job. And it's not because, you know, we're all going to agree on everything all the time. Uh, that's just not the way it is in this world. However, what's important to me is that our leader is passionate about the program. And that passion on his part and all of our part is what leads us all to have different viewpoints on things. But as long as those viewpoints are about what are we going to do next, how are we going to make the next progress, I'm excited about that. I actually today changed lapel pins. I put this one on, which you can't tell what it is from where you are, but it's a lapel pin of Neil Armstrong's first step on the moon. When I was in graduate school, I was pretty sure that I was too young by the way, I didn't think I was going to get to be an astronaut at that time, but I was pretty sure I was too young to be the first person to go to Mars. Well, unless I get to do a John Glenn sort of thing, it's pretty clear I'm too old to be the first person to go to Mars. <laughs> yeah, but, but that's where we're going, and that's where Charlie's leading us, and, and that's where our passion takes us is human exploration. So I'm excited to present Charlie to talk to you today, and, and I guess before that, uh, Dr. Knapp's going to make a presentation as well. So let me hand over for that. Uh, th thank you, Rick, both for that handoff and also for your uh, distinguished service to our nation through its space program. Well, I'm really delighted to join you today for the World Affairs Council of D.C.'s Distinguished Speaker Series and to serve uh, on the Council's Board of Directors. A number of our, my fellow board members are here, and we are an organization very much dedicated to the values that I think uh, Administrator Bolden uh, certainly embodies and to, and I'll talk about just a few of the aspects of his career that uh, touch on that. It is my pleasure to present Charles F. Bolden, Jr., 12th Administrator of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration with the International Public Service Award of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. For decades, space exploration was a matter of international competition, driven by the need to be the first to accomplish some unprecedented feat. In fact, it was called the space race because we were focused on beating other countries, especially the Soviet Union, to one or another scientific or exploratory destination. But by the beginning of this century, exploring the last frontier had become an international venture. The most obvious symbol of that change has been the International Space Station, which was first occupied by astronauts and cosmonauts in the year 2000. But our honoree became a key figure in an earlier example of international space cooperation when he commanded the first joint U.S.-Russian shuttle mission, STS-60, in 1994. Now, as head of NASA, Administrator Bolden has been at the forefront of the, of the push toward internationalizing space activities. He's also served as a consummate leader in a number of extraordinary projects whose progress has been followed by people around the world. These include the Hubble uh, Space Telescope, which was deployed in 1990 by a shuttle he piloted, and most recently, the Mars Odyssey mission that the world has been so eagerly following since the rover Curiosity touched down just a few weeks ago. These examples only begin to suggest the many ways in which Administrator Bolden has proven himself an innovator, a visionary, and a consummate public servant. His work on encouraging STEM education, both in higher education and across the whole educational spectrum, has inspired and guided countless students with incalculable benefits to the future of this nation and the world. In particular, I know that our George Washington students in the Space Policy Institute and the School of Engineering and Applied Science, some of whom are with us here this afternoon, look to his career as a model of achievement and a gauge of what it truly means to make a difference. And by the way, I just learned uh, earlier this afternoon that Administrator Bolden uh, spent some time on the board of the World Affairs Council in Houston, Texas. So he's very familiar with and dedicated to the mission of our organization. And so Charles F. Bolden, Jr., in recognition of your many accomplishments, your visionary leadership, and your deep commitment to global education, the World Affairs Council of Washington, D.C. proudly presents you with the International Public Service Award in recognition of exemplary leadership in space exploration and international cooperation. Administrator Bolden.
Thank you very much, and um, Rick, thanks so much for the, for the intro. Um, it, it's a pleasure for me to be here today, and, and although I do have formal remarks, uh, so that my communications director, David Weaver, doesn't pass out at the table, I, I, will, I, will, I will really attempt to adhere to my formal remarks, and then we'll get into the Q&A, which is always, as Brian will tell you, that's always the, my favorite time, anyway. Um, I want to thank you all for the opportunity to be here, and thank you most especially for the recognition. As you mentioned, I did spend a number of years as a member of the board of the Houston World Affairs Council, and I was mentioning, you know, World Affairs Councils are pretty competitive, and uh, Houston's big competitor was San Francisco, because I don't know whether San Francisco is still the largest council in the, in the world or the country or whatever, but, but Houston always wanted to be San Francisco, and he always wondered, why the heck do these Texans want to be like San Francisco? <laughs> but it's because everything is big in Texas, and we just wanted to outdo them. But what, I think what I enjoyed the most about my time with the World Affairs Council was the fact that at least in Houston, it brought people in from disparate walks of life. You are an open and an and inviting group, uh, you know, hopefully here. And, and one of these days, I hope to be able to associate with this with this chapter I was in mentioning earlier, you know, when you become the NASA administrator, they tell you, okay, you know all those things you did that you enjoyed? Stop. <laughs> uh, can't do that. So, but I do hope to come back home to the World Affairs Council at some time. As most of you know, I, I hope you know, we have a long history of international cooperation across a wide variety of space activities. And in fact, if you look in our charter in the, in the Space Act of 1958, cooperation with other nations and groups of nations uh, in the peaceful exploration of space was envisioned as a key element in the legislation that created NASA in 1958. NASA is just an absolutely incredible organization and we're proud of the global leadership and also mindful uh, that the scientific and human spaceflight achievements of the past, the past half century actually, would not have been possible without international cooperation. Last week, we memorialized and laid to rest the true American hero, Neil Armstrong. The inspiring memorial service at the National Cathedral was held on the day after we marked the 50th anniversary of President John Kennedy's address at Rice University on the nation's space effort that galvanized our nation to reach for the moon and fuel the vision and the work we're still doing to reach farther into the solar system. Right now, we're working on a heavy lift rocket, the Space Launch System, or SLS and the multi-purpose crew vehicle, or MPCV, that will take Americans to deep space again, to an asteroid and Mars, likely even back to the moon. The MPCV, named Orion, is being tested right now in parachute and water drop tests. The Orion vehicle that will undergo a test flight in 2014 to simulate reentry from a deep space mission is at the Kennedy Space Center right now. If you happen to be near Stennis, Mississippi on the right day, you're liable to hear the test firings of the rocket engine that will power the SLS upper stage. That rocket will launch an uncrewed flight around the moon in 2017 and a crewed mission in 2021. And since Scott Seymour and the group here from GenCorp and Aerojet are here, it may not be my rocket that day. It could be the AJ-26 that, that they're test firing, but we have an incredible partnership with, with Aerojet and GenCorp, uh, and they, they give us some good business, and they make a lot of fire and smoke which is what people down in, in Stennis, Mississippi really love. This is all going on while we open up a new segment of the economy to commercial space. Next month, SpaceX begins its commercial resupply missions to the International Space Station after its historic demonstration mission last May with the, with the safe, intact return of its Dragon space capsule. The company also is working toward the capability to transport crews to space. Orbital Sciences Corporation, a local company from Dulles, Virginia, will follow shortly with its cargo demonstration mission to the ISS, while Boeing and Sierra Nevada do their own work on commercial crew transportation systems uh, that we hope to fly soon. Many other commercial partners are developing new technologies that are going to help us to transform access to low Earth orbit and allow NASA to focus on farther destinations. This work brings back to America a crucial capability to launch astronauts from our soil using the systems of American companies. I want to correct a misconception about NASA's direction. 
Some have claimed that we are adrift with no clear human spaceflight destinations and no plans for the future. Nothing could be farther from the truth. And those who perpetuate that myth only hurt the space program, a national priority with bipartisan agreement and a program that generates jobs and pushes the envelope of human achievement. Such talk undermines our nation's goals at a very critical time. The truth is, we have an ambitious series of deep space destinations we plan to explore and are hard at work developing the hardware and the technologies to get us there. We've had international crews of six aboard this space station 24-7 for almost 12 years now. We have robotic missions speeding to Jupiter and Pluto. The James Webb Space Telescope being assembled right now for a 2018 launch as Hubble's successor. And new astronauts in training for the International Space Station and future exploration missions. The milestones we've recently achieved in commercial space and the many capabilities on which our space technology program is working, all this demonstrates that a new era of exploration has already begun. We are in it right now. Since NASA was founded 52 years ago, international cooperation has been one of our cornerstones. We've entered into about 4,000 international agreements in that time with more than 120 nations and touching almost every aspect of NASA's activities. Right now, and I'll have to ask Mr. O'Brien over here, my erstwhile companion traveling around the world. Right now, we have 567 active international agreements. Is that close? That's it. All right. Conducting some form of ground-based or space-based research linked to every continent and working with nations around the world to develop and implement the next generation of space exploration missions, as well as contribute to the faithful stewardship of our home planet Earth. This cooperation represents a win-win for NASA and our partners, bringing multiple benefits to everyone involved. We have numerous demonstrations of this. I look at candy. I had to, I had to take, um, a very good friend of mine was Dr. Mike Duncan, who we lost this past year, and I looked at his widow Candy down there. When you think about international cooperation, in the most unlikely places, Mike Duncan and his team exemplified that when they traveled down to Chile several years ago, when we had 30 trap miners, uh, the, the destiny was sealed. Everybody was trying to figure out, okay, how do we recover the bodies? Because one, they didn't know whether they were still living, and even if they were, they weren't gonna live very long because they were 2,000, I think 2,000 feet underground. And uh, Mike Duncan and, and four other people from NASA said, hey, can we go help? And I, we said, like, how? We don't know, but we think we can do something, and sure enough, uh, as fate would have it, that same day that Mike Duncan said, can we go help, the Chilean ambassador walks into my office. Mike will tell you, Mo Obi will tell you this. And the Chilean amb ambassador came in and introduced himself. He said, hey, would, would NASA help us? <laughs> and I said, okay, I've been through this. I just had this crazy doc who walked in here and wanted to know if we can go help. He said, we're a space agency. What do you, what do you need? He said, we don't know, but, uh, but we think you can help. And so we dispatched Mike Duncan and uh, a team of five people down to Chile. And over the ensuing weeks, um, with, with other people who just wanted to help, a father and son team who picked up their gear from Afghanistan. They were drilling water wells in Afghanistan uh, and came back to the United States, took a break, came back to the United States, and then went down to Chile. And they provided the drill that finally broke through to the miners. But over the course of time, you know, um, one of Mike's team members who had been a former Navy submariner uh, got together with a Chilean, former Navy Chilean naval officer, and they, they developed, designed and developed the capsule that we used to go into the ground to bring the miners up. And sure enough, uh, they were saved. But I, I thought about it when I looked at Candy. When you, the things that we do uh, on an international scale that we never dream of doing because we have people who just come in and say, hey, can we do something? And you say, but what? And we frequently don't know. And that's the way it is with exploration. You know, exploration means we're going to explore. We have no idea sometimes what we're gonna find. And sometimes we don't find anything. You know, John, I, I remember John, John Grunsfeld, the head of my, mission, my science mission directorate. We were all out in, in Pasadena 
uh, the day before the landing of Curiosity. And I mean, we're all biting our fingernails off. And uh, John and I are doing a press conference and, and John gets up and speaks and he says, uh, I have a prediction. And I went, David will tell you, <laughs> you know, when somebody's gonna wing it and they say, I have a prediction, you go, oh my gosh, <laughs> what is he gonna say? John said, I have a prediction. And I went, oh my goodness. He said, uh, you know, when Curiosity lands on Mars, Curiosity is going to discover nothing. And I mean, the room got silent. And I went, oh, I hope he's got a, a good follow-up here. <laughs> he said, when Curiosity lands, it's going to discover nothing. He said, because Curiosity is a robot. He said, but there are thousands of men and women around the world who are going to get the data and the images that come back from, dis from, from Curiosity, and that's where the discoveries are gonna be made. So we do what we do in, our in, in the international arena. We look for non-traditional partners because we don't know what talents and skills they bring. We don't know that some young kid in some African nation is not gonna be the next rocket scientist you know, to take his nation to heights that they never even dreamed possible. Part of our international program and, and reaching out to, to non-traditional partners is trying to make it possible for countries who do not have a space program, probably have no dream of having a space program, uh, actually have a chance to, to at least sample it and see what happens. David's nervous because I'm really off my script here, okay? Um, but, I keep, but I keep thinking, we had a, you know, our aeronautics division, uh, the science mission director had sponsored a, uh, a display of student projects several weeks ago. One project was uh, looking at the water around the, some river in Africa, and four members of the team were from Rwanda. Now, these were Rwandan students here at George Mason and somewhere else. We had, Obi's folk had put on a presentation to uh, representatives from the African embassies in town on NASA and what we do about earth science and stuff. And the ambassador uh, really got excited about this. And, and said, we're gonna have some kids who are gonna participate in some of this stuff. And these four kids, these four college students, actually joined a team and they, and they did this study. And, and they, you know, they're going back home and they're gonna talk about that. So those are the kinds of things you never hear about, but that's exactly what our, what our outreach program is all about. We have numerous demonstrations that are, that, that are going on right now, from the International Space Station to the SEVERE project, where scientists around the world use space data and their own ground-based observations to help us better understand the increasing demands upon our planet's resources, as well as to predict, predict uh, Earth's accompanying changes. Everywhere I go, every single place I go, I see the fire in the eyes of students who are just learning how important science, technology, engineering, and math are, and, they can make a re and how they can make a real difference in the, real, in the world. We look forward to continuing America's space exploration leadership in the global community building on the strong relationships we have now and engaging with more non-traditional partners in the future. I experienced the power of international cooperation firsthand when I commanded NASA's first space shuttle mission to planet Earth, STS-45, or Atlas-1, 20 years ago with Belgium's first ever astronaut, Dirk Vermeer. In fact, we're heading to Belgium in two weeks to celebrate our 20th anniversary as the guest of the Belgian government. We operated 13 international experiments designed to study our sun and Earth's middle atmosphere in ways never before accomplished. It was displayed again two years later when I was privileged to command the first joint Russian-American shuttle mission, STS-60, with a Russian cosmonaut, my friend for life, Sergei Konstantinovich Krikalev, as one of our mission specialist crew members. And by the way, Sergei today uh, runs the Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center outside of Moscow. The relationships we developed on those missions and others served as precursors, first to our extremely successful cooperation on the Russian space station Mir, and ultimately on the International Space Station. I'm truly proud that NASA's work stretches far beyond America's borders and has a positive impact on people's lives in places far from our shores. I believe that space exploration is good for the world, and I see America continuing to lead global exploration efforts and helping to foster government-to-government -government relationships that might otherwise be difficult to continue and improve. Nations that have common interests in science and technology have a basis for common understandings and agreements. I firmly believe that individuals and nations will continue to be drawn together by the promise of space exploration. In proclaiming, and I quote, we choose to go to the moon 
unquote. President Kennedy propelled our space program to the forefront of American culture and consciousness, galvanizing an historic effort on which we continue to build today. Accomplishing Kennedy's goals, both tangible and intangible, we have taken on this vision to create a new challenge and reach now toward new capabilities and destinations. Neil Armstrong first left humanity's footprint on the moon, and more importantly, helped raise the banner of freedom and peace, fulfilling Kennedy's vow to not see space governed by a hostile flag of conquest. We now stand on Armstrong's shoulders to create a sustainable vision for the future exploration of space. Much like the first Apollo missions cleared the way for Apollo 11 and Armstrong to land on the moon, our Curiosity rover on Mars is clearing the path for humans to land on Mars. Our space technology program is developing new technologies that make human expansion into the solar system a reality. Ideas such as a solar electric propulsion and lightweight cryogenic propellant tanks are technologies to which we have recently directed our resources, just to name a, name a few. Investments in our space program have created a global enterprise that continues to advance our nation and our world. It creates jobs and creates technologies that spin off into the private sector to benefit every citizen, from aviation breakthroughs to cutting edge medical devices. Exploration unifies us all in a pursuit of shared endeavor of grand proportions. None of the millions around the world who held their breath as curiosity descended to the surface of Mars last month through the seven minutes of terror is likely to forget the excitement or the exhilaration when the flight director announced at last, touchdown confirmed, we're safe on Mars. At that moment, the imaginations of thousands of future scientists, engineers, and astronauts from around the world were sparked, just as they were at all the major milestones of our space program in the past, from the early successes of Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo, to the space shuttle and the science missions with over, that over the decades, in partnership with other nations, have returned to us stunning images of other planets and other solar systems. There are many other such moments ahead for our nation's space program, when we'll hold our breath in collective awe as humans do something we never did before. These will be the moments when boldness and a passion to expand our human experience combine to achieve new knowledge, when technology enables new destinations to come within our reach, and when we turn back to the Earth to see not how small our place is in space, but how rich is our destiny in the cosmos. America stands ready to lead this next era of, of space exploration and welcomes the support and participation of our international partners in achieving these ambitions. Let me thank you all again for allowing me to take your time this afternoon. And uh, I really look forward to hearing your thoughts and ideas about how the frontiers of our ever-changing world may develop in the coming years and taking your questions. So thank you. Okay. So now I'm supposed to put this guy on the spot. <laughs> Who, who's kidding whom? As a, as a hard-bitten, cynical journalist, Washington insider, et cetera, I, I find Char Charlie particularly disarming. See, I call him Charlie. I can't even call him General Bolden the way I should. I mean, when you, when you read Charlie's biography, of course, it's, it's, uh, it really is overwhelming. Uh, it makes me wonder what I've done with 30 years of free time. Um, and then combine with that with the fact that our combat pilot astronaut is such a decent guy and so committed to so many of the things. So, I, so I'm at a disadvantage, so you guys have to help me out. Put some tough questions down, all right? Just ask them anything you want. I'll read them. I got a few here, but I'm, I want to start. All right, I will, uh, let, me, let me get inside Washington, because I can't resist. Let's talk about funding, NASA funding. What is the NASA funding picture at this point? Obviously, big question mark hanging over everybody in Washington, but how do you think it plays out? And tell me where you think you might be next year. I think if you look at where we are at this point, um, we're in relatively good shape. It, it, as I tell people all the time, it, in an organization like NASA, you never have enough money because I have an insatiable appetite uh, you know, for things that we want to do. But, but we're in relatively good shape. We have what I consider to be a pretty balanced program of human exploration, science, space technology development, and then my favorite, which is really, really, really just a tiny bit, 
uh, aeronautics. Uh, if you look at what we do for the money that we get, I, I think we're doing very well. The prospect for the future is good, unless you're a pessimist and you, know, and, and you believe that, that the people that we hire, we elect to run the government won't rise to the occasion and run the government. But I'm a, the eternal optimist. Okay. The, 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 Some of you chuckle. <laughs> the private piece of this, and we talked about this in, a little bit in Dallas, the private piece of it, uh, the commercialization, uh, take that a little further in terms of what's the business model there? How does that help w what you need to do, and how does it help from, a, from an industry standpoint? This is a question that I'm so glad you asked because it's, this is something that I don't think we, many of us in this room, understand, one, where we're headed and what its value is. The American model is, is entrepreneurship. It, you know, it's taking a need for something and having government seed it, in some cases, and then letting industry run with it. And that's exactly what we're doing in our commercial space model. We have a number of companies, I named two, SpaceX and Orbital, who won uh, the agreements to go off and develop on their own systems that could take cargo to the International Space Station. SpaceX has already completed their demonstration, done absolutely superbly, becoming the first private company, something that, that most nations in the world still have not done, that's sending something into space, safely deorbiting it, intact, and recovering it. They, they've done that. Um, in fact, if I think about it, only NASA, the Russian Space Agency, and the Chinese Space Agency have ever done that, regained something intact, so to speak, um, of that size. Um, so what we're trying to do is give industry the idea of what our needs are, letting them produce it, and then letting us oversee their work, which we're trying to do. We'll purchase the service. Just as we're going to purchase service, we are purchasing service from SpaceX for cargo. We'll do the same thing uh, for getting our crews to low Earth orbit. That allows NASA to take the money that would have been spent in doing that to do exploration. And, and I will tell you, we spent $2 billion a year. If you, if you look into, into what the space shuttle program cost, it was $2 billion a year whether we flew no flights at all. That was the basic cost for the infrastructure for the space station, for the space program, uh, for shuttle. Today, um, now that we've paid off, or almost paid off, the retirement uh, for, you know, for, for USA, uh, our expenditures on shuttle are almost down to zero. So that's $2 billion we don't spend. That money now goes for development of a heavy lift launch vehicle, a multi-purpose multi crew vehicle, looking at other systems that will allow a human being or some human beings to one day do what Rick and I both wanted to do, I think, when we unexpectedly found ourselves as astronauts, and that's walk on Mars. So that's what we're doing. That's what we're trying to do. What about the Richard Branson model, which I, I think is basically a tourist model, right? Mm -hmm. is, there, is, that, is that something NASA that, supports and, and I, we has support, promised? We support anything that, that, is, that brings jobs and, and, and income into the American economy. Richard Branson's model is very good, if you look at it. And he, you know, he's already demonstrated that he, can, that he can fly, and he can go to the edge of outer space and come back safely. And, and what they want to do is take X number of people and take them for hire uh, on a tourist venture for just a few minutes into space. That's good, I think. It's good for the economy. It's good for the country. I think it's good for people to help people understand what Rick and, and Roberto, and I don't think there's anybody else. I think we're the only three in here who have ever had an opportunity. Did I miss somebody? Who have ever had an opportunity to, to, to view back at this planet and see it the way that you're blessed to see it from outer space. The more people who can have that vision, uh, for no matter how short, uh, the more people are going to understand how critical it is for us to come together and to work together to heal the planet and, and make it whole. So I think the tourist model is incredible. Could you ever envision a tourist space station? Yes. Uh, my favorite person right now, and, it, and I hate to say it, to be quite, how many commercial companies, I know, Scott, you're over there, but the, the commercial space companies have heard me say before, I got enough launch vehicles. Uh, I need destinations. And so there is Bigelow Space Corporation, or Bigelow Corporation. Uh, his vision is to put modules around the moon, around Earth, and everything as tourist destinations. He's a hotel person, so you know that's what he thinks about. 
Um, I grew up in the age of the Jetsons and all that kind of stuff. And uh, let me tell you, I, I'm disappointed, to be quite honest. I, I honestly thought, when I went to Houston in 1980 and, and took my place in the astronaut office, something I never dreamed of doing, I thought I would fly a few flights on shuttle and then I'd be off to the moon. And then after that, off to Mars. And we were so close, I think, at the time, and then life happened. You know, we had Challenger, uh, just, and it set the world back. Not just the United States, it set the world back. One of the things I try to do with NASA today is tell people, you know, we're gonna lose people. We're gonna lose vehicles, but that's what we do. And we are an exploring people, and we have to understand that what we do is risky stuff. But you do not go places where people have never been before if you're not willing to take the risk and accept the loss. Uh, where would we be today if people had been afraid to cross the doggone mountains uh, and get out of West Virginia, you know, or cross the Mississippi? Uh, we sure wouldn't be sitting around like we're doing right now. And, and, and we lost way more people in the westward expansion in the United States than we will ever lose in space exploration, is my guess. So what was your plan B if Curiosity failed? Oh, we did have a plan B, as a matter of fact. David said, you don't go speak. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not true. <laughs> no, plan, plan B, and I, can, I don't talk about you know, what, what ifs, but we did have a plan B, as we always do, and plan B was to remind the world that we do have, still have a functioning rover opportunity that's, that's getting data on the surface of Mars, that we still have the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, we still have a number of things that are gathering data that are helping us to understand what are the potentials of exploring this planet with humans. And so, would it have been a setback? Yes, it would have been. Would it have been the end of the world? Not by any stretch of the imagination. You know, we have to get away from plan B being we'll walk away from it. Uh, that's, not, that's not a good posture for a great nation to assume. Get a little closer here. Take us through yep. those seven minutes when the thing was oh. coming down. Uh, everybody, hopefully everybody here knows the, the thing about the, the distance, the tyranny of distance is, I think it's, Rick, you gotta help me here. I think it's 14 minutes one way for communications to Mars. So when, what we knew sitting in the control center as we looked with anticipation, the, the seven minutes of terror, if you saw that video, was because Seven minutes through the Martian atmosphere, this spacecraft had to go. Uh, not quite as hot as shuttle, but hot. And, and gonna get to great speed, and we were gonna have to rely on this huge parachute uh, to stop a supersonic vehicle, which we had not done before. And then we had all kinds of pyrotechnics that all had to work, and I think it was like 86 or something. They all had to work, not, not some of them. Every single one of them had to work. Everything had to work on time. And we're sitting there knowing by the time we got the word that it has entered the Martian atmosphere, it's either crumple, a crumpled mass on the surface of Mars or it has successfully landed. And so we're sitting there with your stomach churning because you didn't know which was the out. The outcome had already been determined because it was sitting on Mars in one condition or the other. <laughs> and, and we didn't see a lot of in-betweens, to be quite honest. So that was the seven minutes of terror. You weren't, you weren't like dusting off your resume we or anything like that. You I was not dusting off my resume. I was ready to, no. I, I'm not surprised, confidence. Um, so where does it go from there? Um, more, you know, does this, does this give us much greater exploration capacity, do you think? Does this, does Curiosity this gives us an incredible amount of data, will give us over time. And, and you gotta remember, everything you've seen from Curiosity so far is just, it's not even the tip of the iceberg. We're just checking the vehicle out. Uh, Curiosity is about to start making it, it has already started making its way toward, uh, you know, toward this mountain it's gonna climb. The Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter has enabled us to identify strata uh, up this huge mountain, areas where if there was ever life on this planet, it, there ought to be some signs in there because that looks like that at one time was underwater. Mm -hmm. So if you t come, try to compare it to going into the, down into the Colorado River and then climbing up the side of the Grand Canyon. That's what it's gonna be like. So it is, it, it, bo it bears incredible potential fruit for us. The one thing I'll say about Curiosity that, no, that doesn't get talked about, and I, I bragged about it. Because of us, because of US leadership, 
there are now mm -hmm, 15 nations that have participated in this, 13, 13 nations that have participated in this great venture, and there are at least five of them who now are on the surface of Mars. Everything from the Russian radiation instrument to, some, to an instrument from Spain that's looking into the Martian soil. So there are five other nations who are sitting on the Martian surface today because of the leadership of the United States. Up until Curiosity landed, that was an unattainable uh, ending for every other nation in the world other than the United States. That's really important. And, and it's very important when we, as a group that's really high on international relations, you know, I see a lot of our international partners in here. We depend, we are critically dependent on the international partners. And it's not a matter of finance. People, people confuse it. It's a matter of global endeavor. Uh, you know, it's frequently cheaper to do it all by yourself. It's a, it's a whole lot easier <laughs> to do it by yourself when you don't have to figure out how to cooperate and stuff like that, but that's what it's gonna so, be. So the guy in the Mission Control Center with the Mohawk haircut. Mohawk guy. <laughs> Mohawk guy who was on YouTube. Did you guys cut his hair on purpose? <laughs> we did not cut Mohawk guy's hair. I did not know about Mohawk guy until we got out there and I walked in the Mission Control Center and I went, what? <laughs> I have to admit, you know, I, I, I'm not accustomed to being around a lot of scientists all the time. Because when they, come, when they come to NASA headquarters, they, sometimes they stop being scientists and they, they try to become you know, policy guys and all that. But it was amazing because he traditionally asked the team, what kind of hairdo would you like for me to get for this mission? And he said even he was startled. They said, okay, curiosity, eh, mohawk. And he, he, he went out and told his barber, I want a mohawk, and that's how he got it. So the, so the reason for my question, I wanna, it gets to a bigger point that we've talked about, which is, and you, you touched on it in your remarks, and we talked about this in, in Dallas. Charlie was, we did a STEM education conference in Dallas in June, and Charlie was very kind to appear there. And one of the themes was inspiration. And we looked at the education aspect of NASA and the inspiration part of it. And one of the interesting feedbacks I got just from the curiosity was how many people said to me, that guy is an inspiration for a lot of people who, you know, it makes science cool. So t tell me a little, talk a little bit more about what NASA's doing in that way, how much you're doing consciously and, and, and what more you'd like to be doing. I can brag about David Weaver and the communications team because um, we have taken on a new persona, if you will. I mean, we have adopted social media. I, I didn't even know what social, honestly. I did not know what social media was three years ago when I became the NASA administrator. I knew I did not tweet. I didn't, I just, I had my phone and that's all I wanted. Just don't bother me with other stuff. I could read my emails. Um, every, every time NASA has an event, a launch of something or anything like that, we usually have a NASA social. And we used to call them tweet ups, but today it's a NASA social where we invite people from around the world to come and they can tweet, they can email, they can do anything they wanna do. That has enabled us to reach millions, millions more people than we were ever able to reach before because we're reaching them in their own, on their own turf. We're reaching the Mohawk guys and the guys that like Mohawk guy. Uh, we're reaching people that we just, we don't know how to talk to. And the people who come to the NASA socials talk, they talk in their language and they tell them, man, this is really, really, really exciting. So that's probably the, the I think that's one of the biggest changes that we've made over the last few years is, is telling our story, allowing other people who are much more eloquent in telling our story than we are. Right. The one issue that, that's come up in the whole STEM education field, and we talk about that, is it's not just about rocket scientists, yeah. which, of which we have some here and of which you deal with a lot. But, you know, I don't know whether Mohawk guy was an actual, you know, what level of science, but, you know, he was a technician of sorts. And many of the jobs that we see that are out there going unfilled are the middle level jobs, the, the skill jobs. H how does NASA communicate with that audience? We're doing things like, we, we have partnered with people like Will I Am uh, of the Black Eyed Peas. And um, by the way, the first song to come from the surface of Mars was something that, that Will I Am had, had, he had written the, the, the lyrics and the music and everything, uh, got a symphony orchestra to play the background and then got school kids to sing the, the words to this song. And, it, and it's about exploring and reaching for space and the like. And so that's the first message that came well, the second message that came from Mars. And, um, but it's intended to reach school kids. Um, we're looking to, to, to reach the mid-level person that you talk about because 
with, with MSL, Mars Science Laboratory, and Curiosity, we actually featured technicians and we featured other people to talk about what they do, what's the role that they play. Um, I take my wife when I go to travel to meet with some of these people sometimes because she really gets excited about the worker bee uh, as a marine wife. You know, the, she's, she's the champion of the, of the quote unquote snuffy or whatever you want to call them, the, the enlisted man and woman who's really the person that makes things happen. And she makes me, you know, she introduces me to the technicians, to the, to the mid-level people who are responsible for doing things. All of, almost all of our satellites are built by sometimes high school graduates, uh, sometimes junior college graduates. So it doesn't take a PhD, uh, you know, to make a space program work the way it does. We have to have those, but there are a lot of people who do the hands-on work day in and day out. Uh, who have a good, firm education, but they chose to stop at the, at the, the AA level in a technical field. Um, okay, this, one is, this one's way outside my uh, uh, realm. Um, it's uh, asked a question about uh, working with the Russians on nuclear thermal propulsion fuels development. Uh, the, if the question is, are we doing that? Um, the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> Not yet. I don't think, and you know, we're looking at solar electric propulsion. Right. Uh, the Russians do, they are a big fan of nuclear thermal propulsion. Uh, if, you, if you talk to the people over at that table, uh, they'll probably tell you, yes, they are working on it. We have, America, the American uh, industry is looking at it, and, and NASA's hoping everybody will start looking at it. Right. Because, again, what we want to do is, one of these days, we want to be able to get to warp speed. Can I say that? Julie, can I, can I use that term? I know everybody says you can't do that, but Rick and I were talking about it. And we, warp speed, we want to be able to go faster than the speed of light uh, because we, we don't want to stop at Mars. My granddaughters are not real happy because I go around telling people, you know, the ultimate destination of humans is Mars, and they look at me like I'm crazy uh, because they want to go to some star that's out there, and so we need, we need more. But it's, so, so talk, that's propulsion is, a, is, a, is obviously a, Crucial topic here. What, talk about more broadly. Where are we in the next generation of propulsion? We are trying to get to the next generation of propulsion. This is very timely, Scott. You guys prepared me very well. Um, you know, we are we are trying to get to the next generation of rocket propulsion. We were talking about airplanes. You know, we're on what fifth, sixth, seventh generation of jet engines, uh, and yet we're on the first generation. I think I'm. Is that close? First generation of rocket engines. And it's not because it's not needed, it's because sometimes we haven't had the will. Uh, I think we, we know we have got to develop the next generation rocket engine. We've got to get away from just standard chemical propulsion if we want to do the kinds of things we want to do. The trip to Mars is eight months right now, roughly. Uh, that's a long time for a human. It represents our greatest challenge, potentially. Um, because that's eight months of exposure to radiation between here and the, and the Martian planet, and we don't fully understand that. So second, third generation pro rocket propulsion changes the whole game. And would you see in that case, at that time, would you see the value of putting men on Mars? I see the value of putting humans on Mars today. Uh, and, and this is, I love this one because if there are, how many doctors in the house? MDs, like, okay, none then nobody can argue at this point. <laughs> you can't be proven wrong, there you go. But, but some of the life scientists believe we have got to solve the radiation problem before we can send humans to Mars. I don't know. You know, I wish I could say they're absolutely right. I don't know. Uh, you know, I like the fact that I don't know, and so I ask the question all the time, do we really have to solve the radiation question before we send the first humans to Mars? Everything we do is a matter of risk. And what we have to do is we have to get away from being risk averse. And I always go back to Challenger. In the, in the, in the space business, um, there are a number of red letter days. In, and I use the term red letter, you know, just because it's something. The day Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, everybody remembers where they were, what they were doing. The day we lost Challenger, everybody remembers where they were and what they were doing. The day that Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, there was nowhere we could not go. Humankind could not be stopped. We could go to Mars, we could go anywhere. The day we lost Challenger, 
we were out of the human space flight business. And you, you could ask, Rick Heave will tell you, you could ask people at the Johnson Space Center. There were a lot of low-hanging heads that day because we thought that was it. You know, NASA does not, the nation will not have the courage to go on. Um, we've got to get out of that. We've got to get back to a, a Neil Armstrong day and a Neil Armstrong attitude. And I think curiosity is a good start. You know, going through the seven minutes of terror, we could have failed. Yes, we could have. We will fail on some missions coming up in the future, but we cannot stop, you know. Yeah. A very specific question from somebody with good handwriting. The Russians suggest prolonging missions to the ISS for up to a year, beginning from 2015. Do you support this idea? If so, why? It's an idea that we have in study right now. And, and we've been talking, about, we, meaning the United States and all of our international partners, have been talking about it for a, for a long time. And we will continue to talk about it. And I, I would expect that sometime this coming year, we'll, we'll probably reach a decision as to whether we really want to do that. The advantage is, it lets you put humans in a microgravity environment for a period of time that, that exceeds or matches the time that they're going to have to be um, you know, going to Mars. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. The other thing you want to look at is what, what is it like to be in a less than 1G environment um, you know, for some period of time. We don't have a place to do that right now. Mm -hmm. And the International Space Station is not a good less than 1G analog because it's almost zero G. So yeah. you, you still got this place like Mars or the moon or something like that. U.S.-Russian relations are sometimes rocky. Is Russia a reliable partner for NASA? I think Russia is a, an incredibly reliable partner. But I will say, uh, as much as we depend on our international partners, we do not intend to relinquish the leadership role. Every team needs a leader. Because if you have a couple of leaders, then no one's in charge. Uh, I have to tell people that at my office sometimes. <laughs> you know, you, you just, all of us know from any organization in which you work, if, if you try to have multiple leaders, you, you just don't get any leadership. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we're the, undis in my opinion, we are the undisputed leader. Uh, we, we, we know that, that our international partners acknowledge that and look to us. And so unless one of them says we'd like for you to step aside, then we intend to try to exemplify the type of leadership that they expect of us. So in that vein, of nations that do not currently have space programs, are, are, which of these do you think it would be promising for the U.S. to, to assist in? We forward? try not to make a determination as to who should be you know, allowed into the family of spacefaring nations. In fact, Michael Bryan around there, I keep referring to Obi. Obi is the, is the head of the Office of International and Intergovernmental Relations. O-I-I-R. But uh, what Obi does is, is he usually travels out before I go, and, and if somebody says, hey, we want to partner with you, we really would, we don't have a lot, mm -hmm. uh, but we've got our brain, and we want to participate. NASA does not go out and pick and choose and say, we think they should be, they are worthy, or whatever it is. We'll take any comers and, and try to help them. Now, here's a question. I think this is the last question, probably. We're, we're, we're getting down here. Um, but this is, this is the ultimate Washington fantasy question, <laughs> only in this town. Um, what would be your priorities if, the bu if your budget was doubled? And, oh. then, and then it gets better, tri tripled. OK. <laughs> you notice I took a big gulp. <laughs> NASA has three priorities that were well established by the president by the president and bipartisan agreement of the Congress. And I would, I would, you know, what we need to do is stick with what we say we're going to do. Uh, we have a heavy lift launch vehicle and multi-purpose crew vehicle for exploration, uh, enhancement and extension of the operation of the International Space Station, which is critical to our international partners, and, and then the James Webb Space Telescope. So those are the three national priorities agreed upon by President Obama and the, the leadership of both houses and both parties in the Congress. So if we got twice as much money, three times as much money, I'd make sure we met those national priorities. Uh, I didn't mention space technology because space technology is required if we are going to do anything. So if I want to work with Julie Van Cleef over there and, and get a rocket that will go uh, warp speed, uh, you know, it's probably going to come from my space technology group working with, with her company. 
Uh, anything that, that, that we do is going to require further technological development, technology development. And then the other thing, if you look at, I didn't talk about commercial space when I said the priorities. Commercial space is not a, pri is not a national priority, but it is imp an imperative. NASA can't go do the exploration that we want to do if we don't have a viable, sustainable commercial space program, U.S. capability to get humans and cargo into orbit. If that doesn't happen, then NASA's going to have to go back and pick that up again. I will quote for you one more time. Two billion dollars a year was what it cost NASA to do what SpaceX, Orbital, and other companies potentially are going to do for a matter of a few hundred million a year. And, and I just, I, I rest my case on that. I think it's, it's an absolute imperative. So I think this sort of relates to the, to the money question. We have a couple more that came in at the late innings here. So we're going to get, um, so what happens at the end of the International Space Station? And then related to that, you know, developments beyond Mars, uh, Saturn, Jupiter, is there is a question specifically, is there a NASA skunk works coming up with crazy <laughs> ideas when they give you the unlimited budget? There's always a NASA skunk works. I just don't know about it. And, uh, <laughs> but I mean, our, if you could ask Rick Heed this, because Rick used to be one of the skunk works guys. He, he sat around and dreamed about ways to maneuver spacecraft and space taught me rendezvous and, and orbital mechanics. Um, we're always looking to the future, but, but we try not to guess too much. Mm -hmm. we, we guess a little bit. Um, I don't know when the end of the International Space Station is going to come. We aren't looking to that. We're actually looking at how we extend the life of the International Space Station, how we enhance it. We'll, we'll support it as long as it's being productive and, re and brings returns, beneficial returns to humans on Earth. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at NASA's vision, it sort of says we reach for new heights to reveal the unknown so that the things we learn and the things we do make life better for humankind. Uh, as long as we're doing that, then we're going to stick with it. If we find that what we're trying to do is say, okay, we've nursed, we've, we've milked that cow for all it's worth, so we're going to move on to something else. Right. But, right. but we're not there with the International Space Station by any stretch of the imagination. Right. You cannot say that was not a terrifically thorough and candid interview. Um, <laughs> And thank you for your questions. I didn't have to do any work. It was terrific. Real good job. Let's give the administrator another round of applause and, and thanks too to his great team. Thank you for joining us for World Affairs Today, a production of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. Stay connected with us at www.worldaffairstoday.org.